manager receives them uh, differently. The this characters that are in this play, uh, Beatrice and Virgil, Beatrice is a donkey, Virgil is a howling monkey. They're, one of the, Henry's frustrations in this conversation he has with the taxidermist, he's trying, he figures he's trying to help the taxidermist create his work, and he's frustrated. He said, well, they're, the characters don't develop. Mm. The plot doesn't develop, and the taxidermist that can't. Just, so I don't want to, I agree with you, this is difficult to, I'm yeah. walking on eggshells trying not to give things away. People are halfway through it and uh, we, we can't ruin things for them. But I wonder if, if there's something static about horror. Uh, exactly, I, there is. There is something static about it. And I think that's why, I mean, we shy away from, we haven't normalized, that's the operative verb I'm using. We haven't normalized our relationship with the Holocaust the way we have with war, for example. Uh, um, our, our dialogue with war is, is a normalized one. You know, let's take the example of France. The, the signs of war are all over France. Every village in France, every ta village, town, and metropolis will have any number of monuments, squares, avenues that memorialize what happened during that war. And people, I said, it's a normalized relationship. It's a horror but it's one that they are in dialogue with, that they understand. We don't have that with the Holocaust, in part because it is static, in part also because whereas war lends itself to all kinds of roles that we can play, and you can switch those roles. So the French, for example, who in many ways collaborated with the Nazis, you know, it's interesting, after the war, a huge number of collaborators. Right after the war, suddenly there's a huge number of resistance fighters that come out of the woodwork. How many politicians in France claim to be in the resistance? You know, hmm, it's funny, we don't remember seeing you in the resistance, but you claim to be. You know, war, you can change your roles. Problem with mass murder, with the genocide, there's not that many roles to be played. You know, they're victimizers, which you obviously want to deny as much as possible, or you're victim. And then there are obviously many, many collaborators, but I sort of include the active ones under victimizer. And the ones that are the passive ones, the ones that just let the trains rumble by, I suppose they're compromised, but we can't demand heroics of everyone. It's a shadier area, so there's a lot fewer roles you can play. And victimizer's victim, it's kind of static. There's a, you know, at one point the taxonomist says, my story has no story, it rests on the fact of murder. It's just that, it's, a, it's an interruption. And so it is, you're right, that's a very good way of putting it, it is kind of static. And what do you do with this static event? Well, I think it still kind of remains in a, in a static uh, uh, limbo. The, the personal effect that this book had, I mean, it had many effects. I mean, it's just it's intellectually so challenging, so interesting, so emotionally deep. It just, it's like, if you look at an iceberg, and it's, you see little seven-eighths, you know, mm. one, one-eighth at the top, and the seven-eighths is underneath, and you collide with it, you know. Um, and it had that effect, but it, in one respect, particularly for me, as a journalist and having covered a lot of things in horrible places, and, and they, the struggles in countries, in, in events like the war in Bosnia or in Rwanda, where <clears throat> there's this ongoing effort on the part of the people covering it and the people who, tap, who are in it to find language for it. And so, for instance, this phrase, ethnic cleansing, became the expression to describe what was going on in Bosnia, because no one knew what to call it. They, as soon as anyone made it analogous to the Holocaust, or, that was shut down. You couldn't, and it shouldn't be. It's something so, that's so huge. But even in Rwanda, when, when Romeo Dallaire was trying to find language to communicate to the United Nations, about what he was seeing, which was a genocide. He didn't use genocide. He didn't know what words to use. Mm. And even years later, they struggle. Everyone struggles with the language. And it, 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 what I worry when, when in, in the course of this, in this, this, in this in Beatrice and Virgil, is that in some senses, the way journalism fails, has failed to describe what happened. I worry, can literature fail us as well to capture this? Oh, well, I, I, of course it can. There's bad books, there are good books. Um, but I think that once we've established the facts, I mean, in any, uh, in any historical event, in fact, horrific or great, the key thing is, first of all, getting it on the record. 
you know, if something fades from the record, then that's it, it's completely gone. Uh, it's, it's worse than a dinosaur, it's even vanished in terms of a word for it. But once it's on the record, then in a sense, we do have to work on the words, the words for it. I mean, already genocide, the word genocide was created right after the war. It was coined, it was a, a neologism to describe the mass murder of people who share one characteristic. And we should be precise in its application. So for example, what happened in Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge is technically not a genocide. Because in a genocide, you technically kill someone from another group. Whereas the Cambodians were killing their own people. So technically, it's not a genocide. Now, you may say that's hair splitting, but the meaning of words are important. Uh, but beyond individual words, which are important, we need to construct narratives because something that happened and how we talk about it are two separate things. And you, need, you really do need those representations. And I'll give you once again an example. It's interesting, whenever you go to any of the camps in Germany, before you enter them, in a sense, the keys that unlock the place to you are representations of it. So most camps you go to, you will have, as you enter, a panel with photographs. The same photographs, there aren't that many, the same photographs of the camp. So before you get to the crematoriums at Auschwitz II, Birkenau, you'll have the few photographs that exist of, it was probably taken when the Hungarians, the Hungarians were killed very, very quickly in great numbers, you know, of Hungarians, entire families just waiting around in the very forest you're standing in. So it's a benign forest. And it, you would feel it's a delightful forest. It's, you know, it's, it's Europe in spring, it's beautiful. But you have these photographs of that same forest and you have entire families Old women, children, men, just hanging around, looking. Some looking at the camera, some looking away. And you know what's happened. And then you're possessed with horror. And then that forest becomes horrifying. So you are given a representation. And then the reality that you immediately see becomes horrifying. Because otherwise, I switch to Birkenau is nothing. It's just barracks. And at the back of it, yes, there are these brick buildings. But it's not obvious that they're crematoriums. They're just buildings. So you, you have the representations first, and then that unlocks the reality for you. So it is essential that we work on our representations. And I don't think that is what we've done well enough with the Holocaust. We've limited ourselves because the victims were civilians and we're not used to civilian deaths. You know, in war, in a sense, when soldiers march off to war, we are pre-mourning them. Uh, the fact that mothers cry when their soldiers go off to war is because they're getting ready that they might die. Well, no one expects a genocide. No one expects one. We have no conceptual framework to accept the massacre of, for example, in the Holocaust, one quarter of the victims were children. We have no conceptual, nor should we have, frankly, uh, a conceptual framework to make the death of a four-year-old child acceptable. Uh, and therefore, it's hard. But therefore, we have to work on the representations. And, we, and they will be bloodless. I had an excellent question. I did an event at, at uh, Chapters in Bayview. And a man had an amazing question. He said, you know, the Holocaust was unbelievably bloody. And in your story, you use the metaphor of taxidermy, which is a lifelike representation of something dead, but it's completely bloodless. How do you link the bloodlessness of taxidermy with the extraordinarily bloody event? Which is a brilliant way of looking at it. And I, I said eventually, well, that's the way it goes. I mean, yes, you're right, words are bloodless. That's all we have. Through the bloodless representations, we have to hope to see, using our imagination, to see those bloody events. But those bloodless representations ultimately are all we have. If we lose those, we lose everything. But the, the representations, the, if they're limited, what limits them? Is it our imaginations? Are there rules imposed on us by those who feel that we can't do justice to it, we don't understand it, we can't? We're not allowed to speak to it. What is it that limits our representations? Well, um, in this case, well, it's interesting. We tell war jokes, but we don't tell Holocaust jokes in public. There are very funny jokes about the Holocaust, but we're very careful where we're apprehensive about where we talk. There's an aura of apprehension. Uh, there's a, uh, I think there's a fear of saying the wrong thing. And of course, you can say the wrong thing. There's the fact that the victims. Um, 